Welcome back to Two Keto Dudes. This is Carl Franklin from Connecticut in the United States. And in February 2016, I put myself on a ketogenic diet to take control of my metabolism. In just two and a half months, I managed to reverse all my markers of type 2 diabetes with diet alone. As of now, I'm 80 pounds lighter with no signs of diabetes or heart disease. Hi, I'm Richard Morris in Canberra, Australia. I've been on a ketogenic diet since April of 2014. And when I started, I was very sick with complications from type 2 diabetes. Within six months of starting a ketogenic diet, all of my biomarkers of disease had disappeared. I've lost just shy of 100 pounds, and I've completely turned my health around. And this show is a document of my progress through ketosis and Richard's experience thriving for years in ketosis. Oh, yeah. And hopefully that might help a few people who are curious about this kind of dietary hacking. Yeah, we're not doctors. We don't want to give anyone any medical advice, but we are keen to share our own experiences. We're actually both software developers, so we're not afraid of a little technical detail, are we, Carl? Nope. We've done some research into our own <laughs> deranged metabolisms and the science behind them, and we hope to share some of that research. Where possible, we intend to put links to the show notes to cite research supporting any claims that we make. And you'll probably work out pretty quickly that we're both foodies. Oh, yeah. We love to cook and we love to eat. Yeah. In every episode, we both share a keto recipe that cannot be ignored. Ignore it? I dare you. Dare you. So, let's start podcast number 87, Sitting Down with Peter Bruckner. Hey. So, Richard, do we have any apologies or corrections from last week's show? So, last week's show was with Ian Robothan, and I don't think that there were any uh, corrections or apologies, but if anybody has any comments, uh, you know how to get hold of us. Yep. Really enjoyed that show. Mm -hmm. So, Richard, let's revisit what a ketogenic diet is. Yeah, a ketogenic diet is 20 grams of uh, carbohydrate, uh, between one and one and a half grams uh, per kilogram of lean body mass of protein. And we get all of our energy from fat. And this is what we have used for over 18 months in your case and um, over three and a half years in my case. And we have reversed our type 2 diabetes. Very good. So, Richard, how was your week? It was an interesting week. Now, I've just gone through what a ketogenic diet is for us. Right. And I've just been to the low-carb down under Gold Coast event yeah, at the Sheraton Mirage on the Gold Coast. And I had a lot of people come up to me and say, you know, I'm very conflicted and uh, I don't really understand this uh, protein requirement that you have and the 20 grams of carbohydrate mm. that you have. It's all very complicated, this ketogenic diet. So I wanted to give people a simpler explanation for what a ketogenic diet is so that they can tell their friends and loved ones when they say, what is this weird thing that you eat? Uh, here was Here is the simplest way that I would describe what a ketogenic diet is. Okay. And that is that we don't eat sugar or starch and we're not afraid of fat and we're not afraid of salt. Right. That's it. Pretty much everything else works itself out. Now, what we have done is we have had a very low level of protein because we're type 2 diabetics, and that has worked for us. But we've always told everybody right from the protein show, which I think was maybe show number four or number five, yeah. uh, that you need to find out what is the right amount for you. And at Low Carb Down Under uh, on the Gold Coast, I did a presentation on protein, right. on what is the right amount of protein. And I was able to show data uh, which is uh, which shows us the the minimum amount that humans need uh, based on nitrogen balance. How much protein do you need to not steal any from your muscles uh, right. to run your body? And it's basically nitrogen balance balances the amount of nitrogen coming into your body as protein and going out of your body as ammonia and urea and and uh, protein in the urine and all of the other sources. So sure. basically what it does is whatever level that you're at uh, a balance on, that's the minimum amount of protein that you must have. Any more protein than that for you means that you're going to be using protein for energy. Using protein for energy displaces using fat. Right. And for a bunch of reasons, that's not ideal. So, um, But primarily that nitrogen balance, uh, there are people who are – in nitrogen balance, having only 0.3 grams per kilogram of lean body mass of protein. Right. And there are people who uh, are only get to nitrogen balance when they have one gram per kilogram. Right. So, you know, that's a very broad range. I suspect the people who are down at 0.3 grams, they may be in the process of losing weight. They may be 
in a weight loss program uh, and actively losing weight. And so their, their needs for protein may be low, but we really don't know until we get more specific information. I have a theory, too, that I think I've talked about on the show before, which is, you know, if you study autophagy mm -hmm. and you think about fasting and, you know, how come there are no protein requirements when you're fasting? Right. Well, fasting works for people who have uh, excess body fat, who have, uh, you know, uh, a lot of stuff hanging around, a lot of junk proteins. Yeah. And so that protein gets recycled. And, you know, just like the calories in, calories out theory is kind of flawed because it assumes that only the stuff that you eat gets burned for calories at a constant rate. But, you know, the, the same thing may be true about protein. If, you know, you're a guy like me who's got a lot of damaged proteins that can be recycled through autophagy. Sure. You know, then there's less protein that I need to eat. Whereas you're, if you're somebody who's lifting weights and in peak condition and doesn't have a lot of junk proteins they may need to eat more to get the same nitrogen balance. I think we all have protein that's misfolded and old and needs to be recycled on a regular basis. That's just – protein is a very complicated molecule. Yeah, sure and is. And so it's rather broken. It, it can be folded in the wrong way very easily, and the body recognizes that, and it basically puts it in the queue for to be replaced uh, through autophagy. And that fasting we do – um, will promote that process. Right. But the thing is that when you're losing body fat, your body fat lives in a, basically in a protein, it lives in a cell, hmm. in an adipocyte cell, in a collagen matrix, and that collagen is protein. Yeah. So it's basically a little fat cell that lives in a collagen matrix. And as you reduce the size of your fat cells, you're always reshaping and rebuilding the collagen matrix that your fat cells live in. Yeah. So as you draw down the amount of body fat that you have, you probably will naturally um, have more uh, more amino acids available in the labile pool to be able to use So yeah. because of that. Yeah. So, um, so it, it does make some sense. I would like to see the data for the person who was 0 0.3 because yeah. that would be fascinating because yeah. that is a mutant. That, so somebody is <laughs> <laughs> surviving on 0.3. There's an interesting reason why that person is an outlier like that, and right. I would be very curious to find out what it is. So you mentioned simplifying. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> All we've done is obfuscate. Yeah, well, so here's the thing. The amount of protein that most of us eat on a standard American or a standard Australian diet, the SAD diet, even if it's a horrible diet full of carbs and, you know, and full of, full of fat, the amount of protein that most of us eat is pretty well regulated and most of us eat the right amount of protein. So right. generally, when you go from, you know, the d dietitian's ideal, um, balanced diet to a ketogenic diet, all you're doing is removing all the carbohydrate and eating fat to satiety and using fat as your energy source. Yeah. Um, the amount of protein stays pretty much the same. Yeah. We personally go lower on it because we're type 2 diabetics and there's reasons for why we do that. We can go into a whole show on that. Yeah. And I think we did. Well, I think we've, <laughs> we've done a couple. <laughs> yeah. So that was my week. Uh, I met a lot of people. I had dinner and drinks with Nina Teicholz. Um mm -hmm. <laughs> we, uh, we did interviews with uh, Gary Fetke and with uh, Dr. Peter Bruckner. Who we'll listen to in a minute. That's exactly right. So that was my week, and it was awesome. I weigh less after that event than I did before the, that event. I'm actually now at the lowest level of, in 30 years. I know I said last week I was at the lowest level that I'd been in 30 years. Well, I'm actually below that now. Wow. So, um, Congrats, man. Yeah. It's just summertime, and I'm cycling, and I'm getting lots of uh, kilometers in. Oh, so. that's great. Yeah. I, I, I can't wait until my stall corrects itself, too. Yeah. <laughs> It'll happen. Just keep calm and keep on. I'm sure it will. Yeah, of course. So how was your week, Carl? Glad you should ask. I um, <laughs> finally got uh, my local paper to publish a story about me. Oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> and it actually happened because, um, well, if you remember when we were talking about Keto Fest, the local newspaper, the New London Day, Yeah. Uh, the, the editor that covers that kind of thing, you know, like medical stuff. Sure. Wouldn't interview me and wouldn't do a story on Keto Fest or me because my doctor basically said she was still concerned about my health. Yeah. And uh, even though I have no diabetes, like, because the doctor basically doesn't understand low carb and cholesterol. And mm -hmm. who could blame her, really? I mean, sure. nobody really does in the mainstream medical. All right. So, anyway, somebody who is a friend of mine who works at the paper saw my transformation, sat down with me at Starbucks and was fascinated and started doing some research and said, you know what? 
I love rooting for the underdog. I'm going to publish a story on you. <laughs> That's awesome. So thank God for Nick Checker who who did that. And uh, it came out uh, yesterday, and we're recording this on the 12th of October. So it came out on the 11th of October in the Waterford Times. Yep. Uh, I don't, as of this recording, have a link, but it was supposed to come to me today. So I'll put it in the show notes. Yeah. But I wanted to read the last part of it, which is about the podcast. And it says, Franklin and mm -hmm. his friend Richard Morris have put together a podcast on the ketogenic diet, which he said has developed a solid following. Quote, Richard and I are not trying to give anything at all regarding medical advice, he said. We're simply letting others know what we've experienced, and it's all been healthy. The podcast, Two Keto Dudes, run by the two men, became so popular that it led to the Keto Fest held in downtown New London this past summer, which drew a vast number of people, many from out of town. Franklin admits the biggest struggle has been the reactions of close friends and family. Quote, those closest to you seem to be the last ones willing to recognize that you might actually know something they don't, he said. Mm -hmm. But one of the great triumphs in all this was learning how being fat actually provides my body with an unlimited store of energy in the form of body fat. I don't have to refuel via the intake of high carbs. My body already contains them. With diabetes, high levels of insulin are the culprit, storing sugar as fat in the body. Lowering insulin levels activates this fat for energy, thus burning calories. Quote, the only way is to limit your sugar intake, Franklin said. Limiting carbohydrates to 20 grams or less a day is sufficient for your body to activate fat for fuel, so long as your protein intake isn't too high. Learning about low-carb diets has brought Franklin a good deal of comfort and now a desire to share what it is he knows with others. Quote, it's very refreshing watching the world wake up to a new awareness of how nutrition works. He said, in essence, you are what you don't eat. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <Yeah. laughs> if you don't eat fat, you'll be fat. If you eat fat, you won't be fat. It's kind of funny. <laughs> Thanks to Nick Checker. I was really, really happy about that article. Mm. Yeah. Now, that's awesome. And finally, we're getting some press in New London. Yeah. After bringing a quarter of a million dollars into the downtown New London district one weekend in July. Yeah. <laughs> You would have thought that would have rated a, a, a newspaper article. but Yeah, uh, you would anyway, have thought. You would have thought, but hopefully they'll cover it next year. Yeah, we hope so. Mm -hmm. All right, we've come to that point in the show where we give away a piece of swag to one lucky member of the Two Keto Dudes fan club. Uh, we're giving away coffee mugs with our mugs on them that say, keep calm and keto <laughs> on. But you don't have to put coffee in them, do you? You can put alcohol in there. <laughs> you can put whatever you want in there. Just don't yeah, drink sugary just... stuff because you'll regret it and you know you will. Anyway, today's winner is Jerry Richardson. Congratulations, Jerry. Yes. And Jerry won that coffee mug just for being a member of the Two Keto Dudes fan club. How do I do that, you say? Well, it's really easy. Yeah. You go to <laughs> fanclub.twoketo.com. You answer literally four or five questions and you're in. And one of those yep. questions is, what's your email address? And so... <laughs> Every show, we'll pick one at random and uh, and send you an email. You'll say, who is this Nigerian scammer? <laughs> <laughs> Trying to sell me a mug. Right, yeah. <laughs> we're giving him away. Yeah, we're giving him away. It's okay, folks. Yeah. All right, well, I think it's time to read some. Mail. Ah, awesome. Well, I'm going to go first. And I have uh, a piece of mail from the Ketogenic Forum. Great. And this is from Mogino. And Mogino says, I'm diabetic. And after hearing and reading about people who had reversed their diabetes, I was determined to reverse mine. Hmm. I came across the ketogenic diet and ketosis recently. And I decided to fast after doing two meals a day, then one meal a day. I last ate on Monday around 6.30 p.m. It is now Sunday morning. Wow. Wow. So that's uh, six days of fasting. Jeez. Uh, this is fairly significant for a newbie. Mm. Megino goes on to say, I have had lemon water with salt, and on two days I had some bone broth. I also had some coffee yesterday too, which uh, I have cut out almost entirely. My reason for writing is that my morning and before bed blood sugars are around 130 to 140. Ooh. I have not taken any insulin for about three weeks, so am I still in ketosis? Huh. Yeah. So here's a couple of things that we really need to get across to you. We're not doctors. Even if some of the people on the forum are doctors, we're still not doctors. No. And most especially, we're not your doctor. 
Mm. Um, and, you know, I, I mentioned that up front because it's really important. Doctors are the only professionals with the training to understand the entire context of your health. Uh, and people on the forum can certainly share what they did, but they've got no idea of the complete context of your health and they really can't advise you. And you should always work with your doctor to manage your health. Right. Uh, I mean, if you, if you think your doctor's not sufficiently skilled to deal with your specific condition, uh, maybe they're relying too much on pharmaceutical treatments or dietary options that are not helping you, then my suggestion is to change your doctor. Yep. So either convince your doctor that you want to try alternative treatments and get them to agree to that. Yeah. Um, and if they're not going to agree to it, take their advice because their expertise is keeping you conservatively healthy. Right. Um, at, you, you can always find a doctor who will work with you to do the kinds of treatments that you want to do. Um, but doctors don't want to be just treating symptoms. They also want to be treating disease. Right. And a symptomatic understanding of diabetes is that it's a disease of inadequate regulation of glucose. And in that context, insulin is just one of the many drugs that a patient can take to lower their glucose. But, right. but the reality of type 2 diabetes is that at its root, it's a disease of producing too much insulin over decades that gradually reduces its effectiveness. Yes. So you have to make and eventually have to inject more of it. Um so a ketogenic diet will reduce the amount of insulin you need, but if you have to inject insulin, then you must, and I underline this, you must go through this process with your doctor. Yeah. Uh, we spoke to Cassie on one of the early shows, and she right. did this as well. She went off her insulin. Yeah, she left them somewhere. Yeah. Yeah, and she didn't have an option, so she, she just um, uh, took a gamble that the ketogenic diet would keep her alive, and it did, but you can't right. rely on that. You really should work with your doctor. Um uh, and they can slowly reduce the amount of insulin that you need as you reduce your own intake of sugar and starch. That's what my friend Les Haley did. He, you know, yeah. he was on a hundred units of insulin a day, and he yeah. just slowly tapered it down until he was off of it completely. And you know, the right. result is amazing. He's lost like a hundred, hundred and twenty pounds. Yeah. yeah, but the important thing here is that you doc you really have to have your doctor involved Correct. In, in in the entire process because you know, you could do something very dangerous. It's very easy to have inadequate amount of glucose to keep your brain out of a coma. You know, mm. a diabetic coma is a very dangerous thing. So I advise not to do that. Right. Work with your doctor. Have them understand what you're proposing to do yep. and to give you advice on how to titrate your drugs down. Yes. Um. Uh, you know that that your doctor will know the vitally important context of your entire health. Um, and there may be a reason for some of these drugs not unrelated to, to diabetes. Mm -hmm. uh, plus, they will know all of the hundreds of other things that could affect the process, which may or may not apply to you. Plus, they will be conservative in their treatment. Mm. And if there's one place you really want a conservative approach, it's in your own health care. Yes. And, and finally, if they do a bad job, you can always sue them for malpractice <laughs> to pay for the medical bills necessary to remediate whatever bad job was done. So, right. so there is also that. So I would be very wary about getting advice on the internet for these kinds of things. We'll certainly, on the ketogenic forums, tell you what our experience was, what we did, and uh, how our doctors did or didn't help in the process. Mm. But, you know, ultimately, my advice is always to, to work with your medical practitioner. Very good. I concur. So that's my mail. Sorry, it was a long one. That's all right. It's a good message. <laughs> so what have you got, Carl? Well, okay. I found a uh, – uh, I was following a thread in the ketogenic forums, and this one is in the newbies section, tips from the oldies. From Ellen. Mm. And the okay. title is, How to Explain to People That Just Won't Listen. And this gets to, you know, my quote from that <laughs> article, which is, you know, when, when asked what the biggest hurdle was, you know, it wasn't giving up bread, it wasn't giving up sugar, it was giving myself an adequate emotional defense shield from my friends and family who were all telling me that I was crazy. Right. And I yeah. just had to believe and have a leap of faith in the science and in my own body's ability to repair itself and just not listen to the noise. So anyway, I, I really feel for Ellen here. So here's what she says. I was just texting with a friend over the weekend, said I wasn't hungry, but in the midst of a carb craving. Her advice? Just have some carbs. Oh, no. Nah. My response was yeah. no, because one, carbs are like crack. You have some, then you just want more. And two, I'm not hungry at all. 
And three, right. I have no garbage in the house. And four, I'm really not hungry. Did she mention she's not hungry? <laughs> yeah. Then I mentioned my accidental 48-hour fast, and she got all upset thinking I was becoming anorexic. Right. <laughs> Tried explaining that my body is simply using some of the more than abundant fat it has stored for fuel, so I'm often not hungry, that I'm perfectly fine and feeling so much better than the last time I saw her in June. But she wouldn't have it, that you don't need to eat three times a day every day. In the end, I gave up and just said, try Googling it. So <laughs> after that rambled rant above, uh, any tips on explaining things in a very simple way to someone? Oh, man. <laughs> yeah. yeah I, 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 I've certainly experienced that, yeah. Oh, yeah, I think we all have. And uh, I, I don't know. I, I just tend to go with the conversation and – I, I have to share what I know, yeah. but what I usually experience is, and, and the, the first thing that I do is I make sure to never talk down to somebody. I make sure to never tr say any right. of those trigger words that make them feel like they're, it's their fault that, th that you know, um, or, or whatever. I never try to proselytize, yeah. even though that is a word that Nick Checker used in the article. Nobody likes to be preached to. Yeah, nobody likes to be made a fool out of. No, of course know? not. And everybody wants to know and wants to think that what they've done and what they know is actually right. And then when they start talking, yeah. usually, you know, it's like, no, that's not true, you know? Yeah. So. Yeah. I generally say to people, when they come out with a statement like, you need three meals a day or you've you know, breakfast is the most important meal of the day or you must have 150 grams of carbohydrates. I generally say something like, well, yeah, that's actually what people think. But in fact, right. and then talk about the evidence. And so not saying, well, you idiot for not understanding right, that. Right, right, right. You, you know, it's entirely reasonable for them to believe that because that is uh, a common misunderstanding. Right. But in fact, we need no carbohydrates. It, our body is, a, is able to make all the carbohydrate it needs. Yeah, and in my case, I say I haven't had I, – I've probably had a 100 grams of carbohydrates in the last six months, you know? In one day, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, in one day. And I'm standing here, and I'm thriving, and I've lost weight, yeah. and I don't have diabetes. And no, it's just not true. And if you don't believe it, try it yourself. Yeah. yeah I don't know. Um I'm passionate about it, but I try to stay friendly. And, you know, yeah. I, I, I like to adopt the Tim Noakes smile when I talk about it. You know? <laughs> I, I, I know the one, yeah. You know, I, <laughs> you just got to be happy about it and just say, uh, you know, it's just, yeah, it's what people think, but it's just not true. Yeah. Yeah. Well, anyway, I, g good luck, Alan. I, I really do feel for you. And, and this is why I printed up business cards. And the business cards have, you know, just some some links on them and uh, usually one statement that is, you know, attention getting. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what I got, Richard. Yeah. That's kind of sad, but it's uh, a journey that most of us have gone through. So. Right. Um, yeah. Buck up, Ellen. You'll yeah, be fine. You'll be fine. All right. Well, that brings us to the interview. Now, you did yeah. this interview uh, at Low Carb Down Under. You sat down with Peter Bruckner. That's right. Tell us about Peter. What is it? What's his deal? Peter Bruckner is one of Australia's most experienced sports physicians. He has been the team doctor of the Australian cricket team, and the Australian cricket team is, uh, I guess, there's probably no real American context, but maybe you could say the American gymnastics team, mm. or maybe. Remember in 1980 when America played Russia in hockey? Yeah. And it was a massive big game. It was the biggest sporting event that had ever happened for America as a national team. Yeah. Uh, these underdogs in America are sort of coming up against professional and army hockey players from mm. Russia. Well, that's kind of what cricket is to, to Australians. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and he was the team doctor for the Australian cricket team for four years. Ah. Prior to that, he was the team doctor for the Australian Olympic team during the 2000 Olympics, mm -hmm. and he was the team doctor for Liverpool Football Club, which is uh, one of the largest football clubs in the English Premier League. Wow. He is the man. Yeah. He's been low-carb himself uh, since he was at Liverpool. So uh, when he came to the Australian cricket team, 
Uh, he actually helped a couple of our cricketers become the best players in the world by uh, reducing their uh, carbohydrates. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. So he has this campaign, and he, he refers to it in the interview, but you don't really talk about it all that much, called Sugar by Half, right? Yeah. And what he's doing is he's trying to reduce the amount of sugar because he figures that, you know, there are keto diets, there are paleo diets, there are vegan diets, yeah. there's the Dietitians Association of Australia's balanced diet, there's mm. the food pyramid. All of these uh, constituencies have a common enemy, and that is sugar. Yeah. So he figured uh, if he does a campaign to reduce the amount of sugar in the school lunches of kids in Australia yeah. and in available in canteens and available through sports – our facilities and have people focus on reducing by half the amount of sugar that they're eating, mm. that that will have a major difference. We, we know, uh, that, you know, if you really uh, want to get a real benefit, you want to get rid of it entirely. Yeah. But certainly getting rid of all of the added sugar, um, it's going to be a significant step. And it'll slow the march of metabolic syndrome for kids, which is really yeah. what you want to do. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And, you know, once you have type 2 diabetes, you really have to go ketogenic to be able to reverse it in, in any significant way. Right. But before that stage, if you can just reduce the amount of uh, sugar in your diet um, and uh, maintain your energy balance, then um, you will have uh, a good chance of not needing to go that drastic. So uh, I, all power to him. Yeah. All right. So let's roll the interview that Richard did with Dr. Peter Bruckner. Okay. Could you say... Do for a What's your bio? My bio. Um, well, I guess my bio is, is that I'm a, I'm a sports and exercise medicine physician, and I've spent the last thirty years involved in sports medicine uh, with my own clinic, looking after an, a lot of uh, professional sporting teams, um, both uh, professional football teams here in Australia and in, in the UK. I was with the Liverpool Football Club for uh, for three years. I've been a doctor at Olympic Games, at Commonwealth Games, and uh, and most recently with the Australian cricket team for the last uh, the last five years. Um, so my life's been very much around uh, around sports medicine. Um, but uh, over the last few years, I've become more and more interested in in nutrition, and uh, and I've just uh, finished my job with cricket really because I, I want to devote the rest of my uh, working life to uh, this campaign uh, right. reducing sugar and to generally improving the uh, the health of Australians so this is the campaign that you started uh, sugar by half and uh, it's a campaign as I understand it to reduce by half the amount of sugar that Australians eat the amount of added sugar mm -hmm. yeah yeah and the you know the, the Australians at the moment uh, have about 15 teaspoons of added sugar a day mm -hmm. World Health Organization has set the ideal Amount it being about five percent of calories, which equates to about six teaspoons of right. sugar. So that's the challenge: uh, sugar by half, uh, reduce by half. We're not saying no sugar, <laughs> no. you know. I mean, that's uh, no one's saying no sugar, mm -hmm. and I I have some sugar, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, we certainly need to reduce the uh, the amount, and particularly among our children and teenagers who have much more than uh, than fifteen uh, teaspoons of, of sugar a day, and which has led to this. Uh, you know, this childhood obesity epidemic that we have with a quarter of our children. Uh, you know, back when I was at school, you know, I mean, right. no, you know, we, I think we had one fat kid in our school. You know, yeah. I was called him fatty. You know, we were very <laughs> sensitive in those days, you know. Or but, original. Uh, <laughs> that's right. And, um, you know, nowadays, I yeah. mean, you know, a, a quarter, I think that's actually a conservative estimate yeah. is, a, is a quarter are overweight or, or obese. And uh, and we know that, you know, overweight kids become uh, overweight adults. You know, right. it's very hard to uh, to change. So, yeah. you know, we've really got to tackle it from uh, from a very early stage. So so that's the challenge. It's an exciting um, challenge. And, yeah, uh, big one. We've got a group of us uh, together and, uh, you know, we're – we're pretty active in in our campaign, both uh, in an awareness sort of campaign mm -hmm. and uh, advocacy to governments and and, and uh, official bodies, and also um, community based. We we really sort of want to push this idea that communities uh, have got to uh, embrace this concept, and many of them uh, have come to us and said, you know, what can we do? And, and yeah. we're providing ideas and uh, and helping communities tackle this uh, this problem. So it's uh, it's very exciting. I mean. I think, you know, let, let's just say, you know, in our wildest dreams, we were able to be successful and reduce the amount of yeah. sugar by a half. I mean, it would have a massive impact. How remarkable impact, would that be, yeah. A massive impact mm. on the health of Australians. Yeah. I mean, I, I can't think of another intervention 
that would have right. as big an impact on on the health of people in this country than uh, than reducing sugar. So uh, let's give it a crack. Yeah, certainly people on the way to diabetes, they only need a little bit of push to go over the cliff, and you know, just just pulling it back just a little bit might be an opportunity for them to avoid most of the the horrible complications. Because you know, yeah. once it happens, it's you know, you're in trouble. So. Well, yeah, exactly. That's you know, that's what happened to to both of us. Mm, you know, and yeah. we've both been on that journey, uh, uh, and it's made a massive difference to uh, to our, our lives. You know, it's made a massive difference to my life, and and I sort of want to want to you know point out you know try and show other people uh, yeah. you know that that uh, uh, and it's it's such a, a no brainer to you know once you've been there and done that you know I think right. you sort of realise uh, uh, you know the effect it can have the massive yeah. impact and. It's relatively simple. You know, it's, you don't it's not have that hard. to. Uh, yeah. No, it's not that hard, and mm. uh, and the result per you know uh, for the amount of effort is is, is enormous. And uh, you know, because otherwise, I mean, what's the alternative? You know, we're just right. going to continue to get more obese. We can't afford uh, more it. More <laughs> diabetes. It'll bankrupt uh, yeah. the health system. I yeah. mean, uh, it's quite clear that uh, you know the major impact now is the. Uh, treating the effects of obesity and type 2 right. diabetes. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, cardiovascular disease, eye disease, renal disease, dental disease. I mean, you know, they're, they're largely related to diet and lifestyle issues. Yeah. And yet, you know, we, we, we have the sort of the, the medical paradigm all wrong. You know, mm. we, we basically have a, an illness based health system instead of right. a health system, you know. <laughs> uh, so basically, you know, as doctors, we sort of sit in our little, uh, cozy, uh, rooms are waiting while, uh, people out there sort of, uh, Eat rubbish and, and, and sit on their backsides and don't do any exercise. Sure. And then uh, when they come in with a chronic disease, we say, oh, "Come on in, yeah, you know, yeah. here we <laughs> come right in." Have I got yeah. Have I got things for you? I've got I've got pills, and, I have I've a got pills and, surgery I, and, <laughs> and I've got surgery. You yeah. know, and uh, yeah. you know that's all going to cost you and the and the government a lot of money. But you know, let's uh, let's do it. Yeah, that's just not. I mean, a it's not smart, right? And b it's not sustainable because yeah. uh, you know we've got uh, apparently you know two million diabetics in a country of twenty four right. million people, you yeah. know, and uh, increasing at a rapid rate. Yeah. And uh, a lot of those people don't actually realise they've got diabetes, Absolutely. you know, and yeah. uh, until they start getting some of the uh, the consequences and so on, we've got to tackle it. I mean, yeah. we don't have any choice. Uh, you know, even if you're just talking about money, let's forget about you know health and the personal issues and all that sort of stuff. If it's just purely financial, if you're the government treasurer and you say, "Gosh, you know, our health uh, expenditure is going up and up. What can we do about it?" Um, right. Well, it's pretty clear what you can do about it. You know, you've got to fix things at the source. Yeah. Uh, that's S O U R C E. It's not S A U S E because there's far too much sugar in sauce. But uh, <laughs> fix things at the source. Yeah. Um, you know, with it, rather than just wait till the damage is done, it's too right. late then. Yeah. So, you know, so are you doing any work with uh, Aboriginal communities in, in Australia? Is that well, part of your agenda? W- well, certainly. I mean, there, there's there's massive problems in uh, in the Indigenous communities in in this country. They have yeah. uh, they have the highest rates of diabetes in the world. And, wow. Um, I didn't know that. It's it's a huge uh, it's a huge issue, and. Uh, you know they they didn't have any of that before white man came along right and yeah. uh, you know we've created uh, we've created that and uh, we've got to do everything we can to to try and unravel that you know there there's a lot of good work going on in the uh, in the communities now uh, education and uh, and also reducing access to uh, to to sugary drinks and uh, and so on it does seem that sugary drinks are the major sort of uh, issue in uh, right. in those uh, those communities but just generally I mean, improving the quality of food i mean uh, yeah. you know i i think uh, the the good thing about reducing sugar is is that the sort of the side effect is you improve quality of food. And, right. Uh, yeah. And really, what we're uh, we're on about, uh, you know, there's so much sugar around, and not just the obvious sort of sources of sugar, mm. but in the on the packaged food and, and so on. Three quarters of packaged food has uh, has added sugar in it, uh, even though it's you know it's well disguised sometimes. Sure. And, uh, my f- sort of principle is, is we've got to get back to eating real food. Yeah. You know, I mean, if we just eat real food, you know, jerf as they say, just eat real food. Yeah. You know, we can't go wrong. I right. mean, uh, you know, it's the way our grandparents used to eat, and you yeah. know, if we're going to eat, you know. Uh, meat and fish and eggs and dairy and 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 nuts and uh, and so on and uh, and drink water and and tea and coffee and yeah. uh, and so on. Then, you know, that's that's a pretty good way to uh, to eat and to live, and yeah. uh, and it's a lot healthier. You know, if you do nothing else but reduce the amount of processed food and, and increase the amount of uh, of real food, you know, with lots of fruit and veg and mm. uh, and and uh, meat and fish and so on, then. Um, we're going to be a whole lot healthier. Major uh, intervention, yeah. Yeah. So I think part of the problem is we've broken the link with teaching our 
children about cooking. For some reason, we've sort of, we, we forgot to teach a generation about cooking and now they're used to cooking in the microwave and pulling something out of a box and putting it in the microwave and they're not cooking, they're just reheating. And Well, part of the problem is that, that parents are not cooking, you know, mm, or cooking yeah. a lot less as well. And, uh, and look, you know, you can't blame parents in many ways. If you've got two working parents, you know, you pick the kids up from, from after school or whatever at, you know, at six o'clock and, and, you know, you've got to have dinner on the table and the kids bath and fed and homeworked and in bed by by, by you know, sure. I mean, it, you it's know, it's the life, easiest yeah. thing is to grab a frozen pizza out of the uh, out of the freezer and uh, and shove it in the microwave, and you've got dinner in five minutes. You know, but unfortunately, that's not smart. And no. it's not doing the right thing by our, our children. Leave aside our generation, it's probably <laughs> – well, it's not too late, but, you know, I mean, we uh, we uh, we deserve what we get. But our kids, you know, I mean, you know, there, there are some people who are saying that this generation is going to be the first generation that actually doesn't live as long as uh, as the, the generation uh, before it. And yeah, that's horrible. And really. that's, you know, yeah. that's a, a horrible legacy mm. to leave yeah. our uh, our children. And we've got to do something about that before it's it's too late. And uh, and certainly cooking is a really important thing. So I think, you know, we need to cook more at, uh, at home. We need to involve our kids in, in cooking. They've got to be shown that it's a fun mm. and, and, yeah. and it's healthy. And it's what, you know, what you do. You know what? It's normal. Rather, yeah. the normal now is uh, is fast food, processed food, reheated food, takeaway food, and so on. Right. Whereas we've got to change that back to uh, to cooking. And you know, obviously, people. The first thing people will say, well, you know, we're time poor, and, and you know, there mm -hmm. are lots of that's a valid. Uh, and that's yeah. a, that's absolutely a valid point. But you know, you've got to be smart. You know, you've got to uh, you know prepare some meals on a weekend, and uh, you know, the, cook some something up and and put it in the freezer or or uh, and so on. And and you know, you've got to be planning and, and preparing. And then the other criticism is is cost. You know, right. it's all very well to say, oh, you've got to wear all this real food, but you know, smoked salmon costs this. Yeah, but <laughs> you know, you don't. It, it doesn't have to be uh, to be expensive. No. You know, and uh, you know, if you eat. Uh, fruit and vegetables that are in season and if you eat right. sort of the cheaper cuts of meat and, mm -hmm. uh, and and you know you uh, you're smart about the way you cook and you buy in bulk and you prepare you know you uh we we tend to sort of just race off to the supermarket buy something for sure. tonight and and you know the first thing that we see and so yeah. on so again you know you, there are ways of doing it as uh, you know in a smart way yes. so we've got to get uh, got to get smarter about that yeah so so the other thing that interests me is that you spent most of your career in sports medicine and looking after athletes at the peak of their uh, physical fitness so are you um, doing anything focused on sport with sh the sugar by half campaign yeah, well, look, th there's a number of things that we're uh, that we're trying to do. Um, you know, there's been this sort of tradition of uh, of having to have lots of, uh, of simple carbohydrates, uh, sugars, and, and right. sugar drinks, and, and sports drinks. Yeah. Um, and you know, every kid running around, you know, thinks he's got to have Gatorade or Powerade and uh, and and or so Milo. on. <laughs> oh, or Milo. Oh, <laughs> um, You know, so uh, and, and you know, it's clearly not necessary, and, mm. and it's just uh, an extra load of sugar that they're that they're having that they don't need. Sure. Um, so that's certainly one of our uh, our things is to improve uh, improve the uh, the sporting sort of environment as far as that goes, and we're encouraging uh, you know sporting canteens to uh, to focus on on selling water rather than uh, yeah. than. than uh, than uh, energy drinks and sports drinks mm. and uh, and so on. So that's one uh, one aspect uh, of it. Um, I think sports people are uh, are realizing now that uh, you know there are other sources of, uh, of fuel. It's another very good source of fuel other than carbohydrates, and yeah. that's, and that's fats. And uh, you know, for all but the sort of very elite athlete. Um, you know, when we're exercising at uh, at moderate levels of intensity, then we can uh, we can use fat as a as a fuel. And yeah. uh, the great advantage of that is that uh, even the skinniest person has unlimited uh, amount of, uh, sure. of fat available. You don't have to keep sort of uh, topping up with more uh, with more carbohydrates and yeah. uh, and so on. So so um, sport, yeah, sport is an important uh, component uh, of it all. And uh, you know, one thing that worries me is that. Um, you know, with all this emphasis that we've been having on, on you know, carbohydrates and sugars for, for athletes and the amount of, uh, you know, sports drinks and gels and so on that they've been living off for years, you know, I mean, what's the long-term effect of that? You know, right. I mean, yeah. now we're seeing, you know, more and more young, you know, re relatively recently retired uh, athletes, you know, sure. um, coming becoming uh, pre-diabetic and, and wow. diabetic. And it's, yeah. it's, when you think about it, it's not a surprise, no, you know, I not. mean, uh, because they've had massive amounts 
of uh, of simple carbohydrates yeah. uh, that has been fueling their their huge athletic endeavors for sure. five, 10, 15 years. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that's that's not healthy and not sustainable. So I suspect some of these athletes have a really good handle on their performance and at, at, at a degree that most normal people don't have. And Jeff Volick found this with his with his athletes, that he found them still adapting to, a, to fat adaption. Six months down the road, they were getting, a, you know, a 0.1 or 0.2 on their personal bests or their performance. And so, and it's something that a normal person wouldn't notice because it's below the level of our perception but an athlete will notice these things i suspect that when they retire they may notice the early signs of diabetes where a regular person might wait 20 years become fat and think well i'm just i have fat genes whereas an athlete's going to be saying wait a minute i wasn't fat last year and now i'm all of a sudden fat and i okay i, I might be retired and la- fat and lazy but you know and so i, I suspect that athletes probably become more quickly diabetic than regular folk because they got you know a bit a, a better handle on <laughs> yeah yeah it may well may well be you know we we always make this joke about uh, you know the retired athletes who've uh, got a sort of a like paunch uh, belly that you know they've been <laughs> in a good paddock and uh, you know that that's a standard thing to say and yet you know athletes shouldn't uh, you know shouldn't all of a sudden become uh, uh, but you know they become insulin resistant because of those high loads of, of carbohydrates sure. that they've had through their their career and uh, and they continue if they continue to uh, to load up with carbohydrates they develop all the issues that we know are associated with increasing insulin resistance like you know metabolic syndrome pre-diabetes yeah. and then ultimately uh, diabetes with all the different chronic diseases yeah. and so on so you know it's um it's it's fascinating uh, there, there are while we're on the topic of uh, of, uh, of athletic performance there are mm. a number of other advantages uh for athletes going on a uh, on a low carb high fat uh, diet right one of the interesting uh things is is recovery oh. and um what recovery is a big topic in in sport mm. you know and by you know by that we mean is how quickly you can recover when you after you really push yourself in a in a, a race or, or a, a game well, let's let's take a, a football team you know sure. have a uh play on a on a on a saturday and you know really push themselves yeah. uh, to the limit and uh you know Afterwards, they're they're sore and they're tired sure. and so on, and um, and they'll have all sorts of uh, recovery techniques that they do. They'll jump into ice baths yep. and uh, and they'll have recovery drinks and uh, and 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 so on, um, replacing the protein and so on. Because and the reason that they need to recover is that they may be playing another game in a couple of days' time, but also they they need to train. Yeah, and uh, the sooner you can train. Uh, well at full intensity then the better it is for your uh, your athletic pursuit sure and one of the limiting factor on how soon you can train is how well you recover so yeah. recovery is a really important thing in in sport and one of the things that limits recoveries is is inflammation and muscle soreness yeah we know that reducing uh carbohydrates uh, intake in particular has a, a significant effect on reducing inflammation so one yeah. of the one of the sort of side effects if you like of uh of reducing uh, of going on a sort of a lower carb higher fat uh, diet for athletes is that they'll often come to you and say oh you know i I recovered so much quicker after last week's game than than I would normally do. Instead right. of being you know sore for two or three days, and then you get out on a couple of days later and try and train, and you're a bit, you know you're sluggish and sore, that they recover a lot better. Yeah. So that's uh, that's one aspect, and the other one is injury. Okay. Um, because inflammation yeah. is one of the important causes of injury in right. uh, in sport and not just in sport as well you know say in arthritis mm-hmm. um yeah. you know inflammation is a really uh, is is the yeah. uh, the key factor that causes arthritis sure. and um we know now that uh you know the diet has a massive effect on on inflammation and yeah. uh, you know to the point now where the first thing i do is if, if someone comes in with an inflammation an arthritis or a uh, uh, bursitis or a, or a tendon uh, in, inflammation is to uh, is to recommend that they uh, they change their diet rather than immediately putting them on an anti-inflammatory tablet, which right. all that really does is mask uh, the issue. And uh, it's amazing the difference in, uh, in in many athletes when you uh, when you take away the I guess the source of that inflammation. Um, their uh, their joints improve uh, dramatically, and, I, and yeah. I've had some you know you some had a cricketer, dr- didn't you? I had yeah. a cricketer who uh, had quite a severe inflammation 
uh, he was an elite athlete, you know, training mm. full time. Yeah. One, of, one, one of, of the best in the world. One of the best in the world. And uh, although at the time he was struggling a bit, to be honest, mm. and uh, he was actually out of the team. And um, <laughs> he had uh, knee pain for a, for a couple of years. And um, he'd been around to everyone and no one could work out what was wrong with his knee pain. And eventually he saw a rheumatologist who told him he had a seronegative arthritis, okay. started him on some very sort of heavy duty drugs. Mm. And when I met him, he was injecting a particular drug. Uh, called Enbrel, which is a very uh, potent and expensive, costs about fifteen thousand dollars a wow. year uh, <laughs> drug. He was he was injecting that every two weeks, and he was a little bit overweight because yeah. he he wasn't able to train fully, and uh, he wasn't as fit as he could have been, and so on. So. Um, to cut a long story short, he, he approached me about uh, about uh, trying a low carb diet initially to lose weight. Really, okay. that was that was his motivation. He wanted to drop a few kilograms, and uh, um, it's amazing how many elite sports people who are training, you know, huge amounts are still a little bit overweight. Wow! And, I, uh, I and never drop would have that, that and yeah. drop that when they drop their uh, drop their carb intake. It's it's fascinating. But yeah, uh, I, I'm getting distracted. So <laughs> back to this uh, this case. So he uh, he decided to go on a low carb diet. He went. It was very strict. We we're actually in India at the time, and oh, not right. the easiest place to go low carb. <laughs> no. If you don't eat rice, there's not much else to eat. <laughs> but yeah. Uh, no, uh, so prior to this, he was having these fortnightly injections. Of, uh, of this uh, medication called Enbrel. Mm -hmm. And he told me that at day 10 or 11 of the fortnight, he would start to get an ache in his knee and he would know, oh, it's time to, you know, time right. for my injection. So uh, once he started this diet, he came to me three weeks later and he said, uh, Doctor, I forgot to take my Enbrel <laughs> last week. And I said, What do you mean? He said, Well, I didn't have my knee pain. He wasn't so triggered I, by the uh, pain, yeah. I didn't, uh, didn't take it. What should I do? You know, should I take it now? And I said, No, no, I want to just uh, wait and see. Anyway, you know, a year later, still no, uh, still no knee pain. Right. Um, he, uh, yeah, he's totally pain free. Yeah. He'd been able to increase his exercise. He'd lost his uh, his weight. Um, he'd saved uh, someone. You know, I think presumably the government fifteen thousand yeah. uh, sure. dollars a year, and uh, he got his place back in the team and nice. uh, and was was rated in the top ten uh, players in the world. So you know, um, it it re that really brought home to me. I mean, I, and I guess you know it was a learning experience for me that uh, the impact that uh, that firstly inflammation has, sure. uh, and secondly the impact that diet can have on on inflammation. And yeah. we know there are a lot of factors that that uh, affect inflammation. It's not just diet i mean we know that uh you know that exercise can improve it we know that sleep can uh stress smoking yep. alcohol all these sort of things but uh the dramatic effect of uh of carbs and uh it's interesting to hypothesize what what it was in in what he was eating that was causing that that problem and uh mm. we've chatted since then and, and yeah. we've agreed that when he retires we'll we'll sort of play a little <laughs> game and challenge yeah. him with different things but yeah. whether it was gluten or whether it's some one of the sort of wheat proteins or uh or so on but uh or whether it's just a sugar uh component sure. so uh we don't know at this stage but uh all i know is that uh and and subsequent to that uh you know i've had a number of other uh athletes who uh, have solved their uh, their inflammatory uh, conditions with uh, with dietary changes, in particular reducing the amount of sugar and processed carbohydrates uh, in their in their diet? It's, uh, it's certainly been an eye opener for me. Yeah. So uh, my final question is going to, and I'm going to apologise to all of the Americans in our audience, and 90 percent of our Americans in our no, audience. No, no, they don't accept. <laughs> don't don't apologise to Americans. So, so, so tell me, how are we going to go in the ashes? <laughs> <laughs> Well, we should explain uh, the Americans at the Ashes is uh, is the uh, um, cricket series, the Test cricket series between England and and Australia, and uh, yes. and that's the greatest rivalry in in Australian sport. Really, yes, is, I agree. Uh, is the Ashes, <laughs> and uh, the reason it's called the Ashes is that. Uh, for many, many years ago, 130 years ago or so, after the first uh, Ashes series, someone uh, wrote a, a, a little note in when Australia beat England, much to the uh, discern of the English. Someone put a notice in the uh, in the deaths column, right. in the obituary a, column, like in, the, in, the, in the Times uh, <laughs> magazine about the, the death of, a, of English cricket and then had been reduced to ashes. Beaten by and the then, colonials. Uh, <laughs> and then someone uh, from then uh, put a, some ashes in a little urn. Right. And... Um, and it's interesting uh, that th this is the most treasured uh, trophy in uh, in sport in Australia and in uh, and in the UK. Indeed, and it's about uh, two inches uh, high. You know, and I mean, <laughs> yeah, you see something. these trophies, you know, like the, thing. Yeah. you know, like the. Um, but it's more important than the rest of them. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So it's not the size of the trophy; it's it's the meaning of the yeah. trophy. So, uh, so this this cricket series is played every uh, every couple of years, alternatively in in England and, and in Australia. And uh, uh, I've been involved in uh, in both the winning series and yeah. losing series, and yeah. it's not a very 
very nice experience the uh, the latter i can no. assure you but uh, so it's about to happen uh, in this uh, over this australian summer and uh, there's a there's a five test series we uh, the england english actually hold the ashes because yeah. they won the last series in england which they uh, should never they have won. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> don't worry i'm still working through that with my yeah. therapist but um yeah we're uh, we're confident uh, this year that we'll uh, nice. we'll get the ashes back so we're looking forward to a great summer of yeah. uh, of cricket i'll be you going to the boxing on, day uh, test uh, oh yeah that's uh, the um we should explain again that the Boxing Day is <laughs> Boxing Day is December the twenty sixth, the right. day after Christmas. Yes, and the tradition in uh, in Melbourne, uh, Australia, which is a sports crazy city, is that uh, everyone goes to cricket. So you have your big Christmas dinner, yeah. you, know, you have your turkey and and so on, and then uh, the next day you you make your turkey sandwiches and you uh, yeah. <laughs> and off you go to the. Uh, to the cricket, and uh, there'll be a hundred thousand people yeah. uh, at the cricket on uh, the MCG on, uh, the yeah. MCG on, on Boxing Day, and uh, my kids and I'll be uh, be in that uh, in that nice. group as we have been for the last uh, um, twenty odd years, and, and so on. So it's a great uh, it's a great family uh, tradition. So it'll be nice to actually go back to experiencing it as a as a spectator and a fan rather yeah. than sort of being uh, on the job, being, uh, <laughs> being on the job, and uh, yeah, having well. to. Uh, Having to having to work for it. Well, thank you for your service, uh, both to Australian cricket and Australians, and also for the Sugar Boy Half campaign. That is awesome, and uh, thank you for being our guest. My pleasure. Heard you say you're due for a little. Wow, uh, what great stories! Um, I took away a few key points from that interview, Richard. Mm. First one, I was astonished to hear about the Aboriginals, the First Nations in Australia, right. having the highest incidence of diabetes in the world. Yeah, it's actually First Nations people uh, from around the world that have this problem, mm. but uh, it's specifically very uh, troublesome for Australian Aboriginals. Yeah, the Western diet sort of creeped in and they you know they've been living for thousands and thousands and thousands of years without all of this uh, processed food and it just hit them like a ton of bricks, didn't it? Mm. Yeah, well, one of the things that we did was we gave them all uh, weekly rations, which were was white flour, sugar, and tea uh, that they could combine with the meat that they can they can uh, pick up plus vegetables if they can find any. Mm. So you know it was really force feeding uh, uh, carbohydrates on a population that really isn't. Uh, well set up to deal with uh, carbohydrates. Yeah. Actually, I'm planning to speak with the Minister for Aboriginal Health very soon and uh, hopefully do some things for our Aboriginal communities in Australia because um, if we can turn back diabetes in uh, Carl and I, there is absolutely no reason that we can't help other people, uh, such as people in the Aboriginal communities, right. to turn back their own diabetes. And as you know, Richard and I are expanding our podcast empire to bring in more people yeah. to do more podcasts for particular mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, demographics. And so we would love to find that host for an Aboriginal show, for uh, yes. a, a Native American show, for cultural yeah. uh, sections of uh, all throughout the world, whether it's Black, Hispanic, yeah. Latino. Um, mm -hmm. Middle Eastern, uh, you know, Indian, uh, Indian American, whatever it may mm -hmm. be. Uh, if if yeah. you think you are that person, then definitely get in touch with us because the world needs help. Absolutely. Uh, another thing that uh, you guys talked about, which I thought was especially poignant, was the need to cook at home involving your kids. Yeah. 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 We got to do you know, that. You know, that, yeah. Actually, we've got to do that right now because you know what it's time for? Uh -huh. It's time for recipes! <laughs> what you got, Cal? Uh, well, I found this recipe on the ketogenic forums, the source of all things awesome in keto. And yep. <laughs> this was posted by Catherine. It's foricol, or lamb and cabbage. And it's, uh, as Catherine says... Norway's official national dish, and it's as uncomplicated as lamb and cabbage simmering for hours until the meat is falling apart. She says, I made this yesterday and we're having it later today. It's always best reheated the next day, and this is how it's done. <laughs> it is so easy. It's two kilos of miscellaneous lamb cuts. Right. And, you know, you want the fatty cuts like legs and mm -hmm. bony parts. You want bone and fat and meat, right? Of course. Shoulders. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, one to two kilos of cabbage, two to three teaspoons of salt, and freshly ground black pepper, and one tablespoon of whole black pepper, so peppercorns. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you cover the bottom of a large pot with the fattiest meat cuts and sprinkle with salt, ground pepper, and whole pepper. Cover the meat with cabbage cut in slices. 
And when I say slices in the pictures that I've seen, they look like wedges, you know, just. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. They'll fall apart. They'll fall apart. It doesn't really matter. Um, but the slices should be still connected at the base. That keeps them from falling apart, I guess. So you sprinkle again with salt and pepper, add a new layer of meat, and repeat the layers until the pot is full or you're out of ingredients. So it's like a lasagna. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's layered. <laughs> exactly. It's a meat cabbage lasagna. So you add the water and cover the pot and get it boiling. And then you turn down to low and let it simmer for at least two and a half hours. And be checked to make sure that it's not boiling after a while so the pot doesn't boil dry. And pretty much that's it. It's usually served with boiled potatoes, but cauliflower just uh, is, is just as good. Yeah. So she links to the recipe in Norwegian. And of course, mm-hmm. you know, if you're using a modern browser, it'll translate it for you. The thing that nice. I like about this is its simplicity. You're getting the taste right. of the meat, the taste of the cabbage without a lot of extra spices and other things. Yeah. However, me being me, I would want to experiment <laughs> with flavors, you know? Sure. But uh, yeah. Chuck a little bit of vinegar in there, just a little yeah, bit of tart. Yeah, a little vinegar, or, maybe a little yeah. tomato paste, maybe a little- Maybe a little, maybe uh, a little mint or something. Mint. Or, or, yeah. <laughs> some kind of, yeah, maybe some garlic. Rosemary. Rosemary. Mm. Okay. All right, you know. <laughs> I'm, getting a, I'm getting a taste for lamb right yeah, now. Yeah, <laughs> I love lamb. Lamb is wonderful. All right, what do you got? I've got uh, the meal I've been eating for the past two days, and that is fish Thai green curry. Wow. And I've posted this on my uh, my Instagram uh, and my Facebook post, and everybody's been talking about it. So uh, this is actually Julie's turn to cook. Most days I cook, but uh, every now and then Julie will do a, a meal, and oh, this was so good. Oh. So what we do is we start with uh, we start with some Thai green curry paste. Now what we use is we found a, com- a commercial one, and what we do is we go to the shops and we we check all of the the curry pastes, and you'll see there'll be a range of carbohydrate content. Uh, the one that we have is 1.7 grams per 100 grams. So it's 1.7% carbohydrate. Yeah. And, but there are some that are like 30 or 40% carbohydrate. Okay. And, you know, it's, it's ridiculous. It's Gotta watch out. Palm sugar and all these other things. Yeah. So uh, we use a, a commercial Thai green curry paste, but you can make Thai green curry. It's not that difficult. In fact, we did it at Keto Fest. We did, we did it with the, the pulled beef. Yeah. So to make Thai green curry, you start off with some coriander seeds, some cumin seeds, some black peppercorns, and you roast them for about a minute. And yeah. what you're trying to do is you're trying to get the flavors to develop a little bit. The, the seeds will crack a bit. The oils will come out. Yeah, that's it. And then you throw them in a mortar and pestle or a grinder and you grind those seeds down. And then you're going to chop uh, four to six green chilies uh, with the seed, uh, de-seeded chilies um, and chili peppers. So... Um, uh, Four to six green chilies. We throw them in the mortar and pestle. Uh, we we chop up two shallots. Throw that in as well. We get about two inches of ginger grated into the mortar and pestle. Mm. Two two garlic cloves. So garlic and ginger work really well together yeah. there. And then you get a bunch of coriander and you chop it up. And you want the root of the coriander as well. That that's mm. the bit that you really want. That the, the leaves just make it go green, but yeah. the root is the bit that's got the real flavor. Uh, two stalks of lemongrass, uh, chop that up uh, and throw it in the mortar and pestle. Now, when I say mortar and pestle, you could you could use a magic bullet blender. Sure. It doesn't matter. Um, and eight kaffir lime leaves. And these are these we're putting in for flavor. Yeah. We will put some in later on for a garnish. But so you kaffir lime leaves uh, and about a, an inch of galangal. And galangal is. Uh, is a root very similar to ginger. By the way, don't use powdered ginger. That's a totally different thing. Yeah, so yeah. we're using fresh ginger root and we're using galangal root. Uh, if you don't have galangal, just use uh, three inches of ginger instead of two inches. So grind this up into a paste and then you blend it with uh, the uh, some zest from a lime and the juice from a lime, about two teaspoons of Thai fish sauce and one teaspoon of belachan. Belachan is known as shrimp paste, and if you ever smell it, you think there is no way that I'm going to eat any <laughs> food that's made with that, but it is necessary. It gives an umami sort of unctuousness to yeah, it. Yeah, it's the same idea as using the anchovies with tomato and garlic, tomato paste Absolutely. and garlic. You, you, you don't taste the yep. fish, but no. it brings out the umami. It's an umami bomb. Umami bomb. So you, you grind all this up, 
And now what we used to do is we used to, before we found a commercial uh, product that was just as good, we used to make this up and we used to put it in ice cube trays. Yeah. And so then you have an ice cube tray and once they're all frozen, you just um, uh, put them in a in a freezer bag and you just have a, a nice block of uh, green curry paste. Yeah. Uh, it's just the same as using it straight from a jar. Right. But, you know, in the freezer, it's going to last forever. So it's yeah. a really good way of doing that. So we've made our green curry paste. That's the essence of the meal. What we're going to do is we're going to put that green curry paste in a fry pan with about 15 grams or half an ounce of lard. Okay. And we're going to fry that down. And then to that, we're going to add about 75 grams or two and a half ounces of capsicum or bell peppers that we've chopped up Mm -hmm. into that mixture. And now what we're going to do is we're going to add about 650 grams of fish to it or about one and a half pounds. And this, we use ling, which is a, you, you want a fish that's, we use a white fish, but you can have any kind of fish, but you want something that can hold up to a bit of boiling. Um, so something like cod or something, you know, fish like that. And, uh, so you're going to cut that into cubes and you're going to put it into the, into the, the paste mix and, and move the pan so that it coats the fish. So the fish has that curry paste coating to it. And then what we're going to do is we're going to throw about 20 ounces or 600 mils of coconut cream. Nice. You can use coconut milk as well uh, and reduce it down a little bit, but coconut cream is the the, the best part Ooh. of the coconut milk. <laughs> oh, yeah. And just at the end, what Julie does is she gets about six kaffir lime leaves and she chiffonades them, which is basically cut, cutting them into matchstick yeah. uh, slivers and uh, throws them in as a garnish so nice. that you actually see it in the food. The kaffir lime that's adding the flavour has already gone into the paste right. and it's rendered down in the paste. But this is just to, sh- to remind you what you're eating. Wow. And she also adds about five ounces of puck choy, uh, about 150 grams of puck choy, and 100 grams of choy sum, which is about three and a half ounces. These are just two Chinese vegetables. You can you can, you can can just use spinach, you can use broccoli, you sure. can use any kind of vegetable, but we use the, the Chinese ones because they were nice and cheap. Mm. And you just let it simmer for a little bit and then you plate it up. And we plated it with some Thai basil. And Thai basil is for people who don't like coriander like me, have a genetic uh, issue where coriander tastes like soap, mm-hmm. Thai basil is a really good alternative. Yeah. If you don't care about it, you can use coriander. Just couple, throw a couple of leaves on top as a, as a garnish. And that's uh, – that's uh, fish Thai green curry. I am coming to your house for dinner someday. <laughs> no, I'm coming to your house for dinner. <laughs> I guess you are, yeah. <laughs> I'm at, right, in about in about uh, five hours' time, I am, I'm actually getting on a plane and going to visit Carl. Yep, that's right. I will cook you this meal. <laughs> oh, I can't wait. <laughs> well, this has been a great show. It's been a little long, but uh, I really appreciate all the work that you did with Dr. Bruckner, and thanks for getting that interview, Richard. No worries. Uh, of course, if you have anything that you want to tell us, something we said wrong, something you don't agree with, or some more research that you found to support or refute anything that we've said, send it by email to dudes at 2 dudes.com or post it on our website. And you can follow us on Twitter at 2 dudes, on Instagram at 2 dudes, and make sure to use the hashtag... Two Keto Dudes. And of course, if you want to join the free ketogenic forum, it's forum.2keto.com. And if useless swag is your fancy, like t shirts and coffee mugs and all that other junk with witty keto sayings on them, head over to gear.2keto.com. <laughs> and if you want a shot at getting that swag for free, join the Two Keto Dudes fan club. You'll be eligible to win something in every show. Go to fanclub.2keto.com. And if you feel like supporting our podcasts and our forums, think about making a pledge on our Patreon page at patreon.2keto.com. Or just hit the donate button on our website at www.2ketodudes.com. Or just go to donate.2keto.com. And you can also see our podcast and other videos on YouTube, like the videos from KetoFest at youtube.2keto.com. And if you haven't already, go leave us a review on iTunes. That's how new people get to know about what we do. And the last time I looked, we had about 155 five-star reviews. Oh, wow. Thank you, people. That is awesome. Yeah. It makes us feel better about what we do, too. Sure does. But thank you. Two Keto Dudes is brought to you by Two Keto LLC and produced by Pop Productions, providing audio, video, and podcast production services since 2002. Online at PWOP. Dot com. Keep calm and keto on, my friend. Yeah, keep calm and keto on, Carl. All right. We'll see you next time on Two Keto Dudes. Keto Dudes.